All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Nate Kleinman. I am a farmer down in New Jersey. Um, I grow seeds primarily, and uh, I run a nonprofit called the Experimental Farm Network, which I will talk more about during the talk. I'm going to try and blast through this pretty fast. I've got 167 slides or something. So uh, it's going to take, yeah, we'll, we'll go pretty quick. Um, I'm going to kind of run through how I got into this work and then um, get more into the nitty gritty. There's not, there's not really much technical in this talk about uh, how to breed plants, but I'm happy to nerd out on that afterwards if anybody wants. Um, this is sort of, uh, a lot of it's kind of conceptual and talking about possibilities um, and, uh, and some of the ways we're going about it. Um, so I actually became a farmer uh, because of work that I did through Occupy Sandy, which was the Occupy Wall Street um, hurricane relief organization that sprung up after, uh, after Hurricane Sandy. Um, this is in northern New Jersey, uh, just across the uh, Raritan Bay from Staten Island. Uh, a lot of people, you know, when that, that hurricane hit, uh, the boardwalk got a lot, of, a lot of attention and everything, but people didn't realize that it was people living in some marginalized communities that were really hit the hardest. And um, I started thinking about climate change as a social justice issue. Um, yeah, I'm going to clip this on here. How's that sound? Cool. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about climate change, which is sort of the overriding, overriding theme of, of all, all of the work that I'm doing. Uh, so I, I don't need to belabor the point, but here's the Muir Glacier, 1941 and 2004 up in Alaska. Um, this is what the uh, this is what the coastline will look like after after the ice caps melt, which is where we seem to be heading. Um, but this is one that's really uh, really important that a lot of people don't don't really understand. This is from from the government uh, climate.gov site. These are days above 100 degrees in the in an entire year. Uh, so. You can see the southwest is where a lot of these uh, is where a lot of this comes from, and then that uh, that was 1961 to 1979. These are the projections for 2080 to 2099. Um, New Jersey, where I farm, is going to be up to 45 to 60 days above 100 degrees every year. Uh, in other parts of the country, it's just not going to be possible to grow the crops that we currently grow. Um, this is a map of uh, drought. The, um, the darker red and purples are where uh, places that are in drought uh, from that, in that decade. Green is the places where it's a little bit wetter, a little nicer. Uh, this is the projection for 2030 to 2039. See that change? And then this is the projection for 2060 to 2069. Um, you can see things are not, not looking good. Um, a lot of the places where we grow a lot of food are going to be really, really dry. Uh, and then the wet areas are up in the Arctic where the permafrost is going to continue melting. It's just going to get worse. So obviously, uh, you know, people, people blame emissions for a lot of this climate change, and that's obviously a huge part of it from factories and the like, um, fossil fuels. Uh, but agriculture is about 24%. Uh, agriculture and land use is about 24% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and of course, that's not just coming from the big machines that, uh, that are out there um, and from the chemicals that are, that are produced on and used on fields, um, but it's from the act of tillage itself. Every time you till the soil, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And that's true whether you're using a tractor or uh, whether you're using horses going the old-fashioned way. Um, so obviously, a big problem uh, with our agricultural system is monoculture. Uh, so this is uh, this is corn, surely ge genetically modified, soybeans, wheat, sugar beets, canola. Those are our big those are our big commodity crops in this country. And 
You know, we have this fiction of uh, diversity when you go to the supermarket. There's all these different colors. But it's really almost all of it's coming from those main ingredients. And uh, uh, there's increasingly less and less nutrition in our food. And we're eating fewer and fewer uh, different crops. Um, so agrobiodiversity. So this, is, uh, this graphic shows um, the different crops um, a century ago, 1903, this is what was found in a survey of seed catalogs. 497 varieties of lettuce, 338 um, cantaloupe, musk melons, 463 different radishes. And then those same, uh, those same varieties were looked for in um, 1983, 80 years later, and uh, they had diminished significantly. Most of them had disappeared and, and just weren't available anymore. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, anyone of you recognize this crop? Uh, can you guess the name of this particular potato? This is a very famous potato. No, close. This is called the Irish lumper. And um, this was the potato that was grown in Ireland before the potato famine. And it was pretty much the only potato that they were growing. Uh, this is the kind of diversity you might find in a market in Peru, uh, but this is what they were growing there in Ireland. The uh, Irish potato famine is the common story that people under, uh, understand. You know, if you had the diversity that they have in Peru, if you had a blight that affected one, you'd still have some that would survive. But they were only growing one, they were all susceptible, they all died. Um, so. It's really critical that we expand agrobiodiversity because as these you know, as seed companies are selling fewer and fewer varieties, um, the big companies are, are sending fewer and fewer varieties our way, what farmers are growing is diminishing. And so we are more and more uh, susceptible to, to major blight issues like that. Uh, but it is possible to, to develop new varieties. These are potato berries, uh, most people don't notice them if they're growing them or don't think much about them, but those tiny seeds inside will each grow a unique potato plant. It's not hard to do. They grow just like tomatoes. This is a little baby potato seedling. And every time you grow a potato from seed, you're growing something unique, uh, as opposed to a clone, which you're growing from other ones. Uh, this is a potato that I grew from a seedling, from a potato called Pig Knuckles uh, that Tom Wagner grows. And uh, this is another one, there's, you know, you can see there's all sorts of different color combinations you can be found. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the basics of plant breeding. Um, bottom right corner is a watermelon, and that's, that's what watermelons look like in the 1700s. Some of the wild relatives of watermelons, this is a picture from the USDA of uh, Citrullus amaris, a bitter watermelon uh, from, from Africa. This is, a, this is another close cousin of watermelon, uh, Citrullus colosynthus, also, also from Africa. Actually, I think this one's from Oman. It's a desert, desert plant. Uh, this, is a, this is an actual cultivated watermelon from Syria. You can see how different it looks from the kind you might find in the, in the supermarket. This is from Holmes, and it's kind of a, um, it's not as juicy. It was probably used for drying, for candying, um, maybe even for roasting. There's some grilled, roasted uh, watermelon dishes that are popular over there. Uh, and then this is the Charleston Gray, kind of a common watermelon. Um, from years of breeding and selection, you could, th this crop went from something that looked more like this to something that looks like that. Um, this little, uh, little strawberry is called a... Uh, Chilean beach strawberry, or uh, uh, Fragaria kiloensis. And uh, in 1714, I believe, a French spy brought this plant from, uh, from South America back to France. And in a garden there, it was accidentally, it's, it's believed at first, crossed with an American wild strawberry species. This is Fragaria virginiana, or the scarlet strawberry. And uh, the resulting cross developed what we now know as the garden strawberry. If you've ever eaten a strawberry, 
It's the result of this chance cross between a South American and a North American species that happened in France two or three hundred years ago. Uh, one concept I want to talk about quickly before we move on is a land race. You might have heard it if you're in the seed world. Um, and a land race is basically a population of cultivated plants that's grown in a particular area by traditional farmers and it is, um, it's, it's got genetic diversity, it's not been, uh, it's not been standardized through uh, traditional plant breeding, it is, um, it, is a, it is a wider population. Most seed companies are not selling land race populations because uh, most commercial farmers want to know exactly what they're going to get and a land race uh, doesn't let that happen, you, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, this is a longer definition of it. This is, a, this is a population of okra from Afghanistan. And you can see the wide range of, uh, of different sizes and shapes. We grew this in Jersey a few years ago. Um, this is a land race squash from the Nanticoke people in, um, in southern Delaware and uh, eastern shore of Maryland. You know, you can see in this population of squash, there's, there's a lot of different forms here. And this is from an area that, again, in the, in, in the probably 1600s, 1700s, was a real center of global trade. So a lot of these squash traveled around the world and became the heirloom varieties that, uh, that we know of today. You can kind of recognize some forms. There's something that looks like a Turk's turban squash there, or maybe a red curry from Japan. Some of these blue ones are reminiscent of the, the Queensland blue and these, these uh, squash from Australia. Uh, but it, it all came from the same original populations. That's just maybe the coolest one that, I, that came out of this population. Um, these are some land race wheats from Turkey. This is just a tiny glimpse of the kind of diversity that exists in, in wheat. Um, and this is a, just a glimpse of some of the corns that you might find down in Mexico. Some people who are in the seed world are um, working on creating new land races. With, because a land race for a plant breeder is critical. That, all that diversity enables you to find all, the diff, all kinds of different traits depending on what you're looking for. So uh, the great folks at Adaptive Seeds, have, they sell this kale coalition which has got um, loads of different, loads of different uh, types in it. Um, you never know what you're going to plant, when, what you're going to get when you plant one of these seeds. Um, so a lot of the seeds that we work with come from uh, threatened farming communities where uh, it's really important that we, that we save a lot of this uh, germplasm, a, uh, a lot of these varieties. Um, so this is, a, this is a, actually a shallot from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a place that obviously the, the hurricane caused a lot of damage, but um, the, uh, the colonial system has caused even more problems for, for agriculture in Puerto Rico. They're almost completely reliant on imported cheap food from, uh, from North America. And, uh, and because of the Jones Act, they're only able to get uh, shipments that come from, from a U.S. port. So um, they're really kind of trapped down there, and there's, there, is, there are not enough people growing and saving some of this old, uh, old stuff. Uh, this is another Puerto Rican crop. This is a purple yam. Uh, that a friend of mine is saving. Some pigeon peas, uh, a really cool perennial plant called Cannavalia or a jack bean. These are um, edible. The seed coat is not edible, but there's a big uh, green uh, uh, seed inside of that that is edible. Um, but this is a great perennial. It's used for nitrogen fixing in, in, um, uh, in the garden. This is actually a melon from the Maldives, which is, uh, the Maldives is a low-lying island country in the Indian Ocean, and it's one of the first countries that's going to disappear under the waves uh, as the seas rise. Um, so this kind of, you know, this kind of genetic diversity is going to be lost completely if we don't, if, if people aren't growing this stuff and saving it. This, this, the, uh, this, clearly this melon was bred for the gel around the seeds and not for the flesh of the melon like, uh, like most of our most of the melons that you're familiar with. Uh, it's actually got a sour flavor, but it's, the juice is really tasty, and um, 
apparently it's, it was mixed with sweet fruits and eaten. That's what we've heard. Uh, possibly served to animals. The outside would be served to pigs. Or, um, and when it's young, that melon can be used like a cucumber. Uh, this, is a, this plant's called chipilin. It's from Central America, another legume. Um, this is this Kandahar cress that uh, was collected by the USDA in the 1950s in the market in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and then just sitting there in the USDA gene bank for decades. Nobody knew what it was. We dug it out, and we thought it was interesting because of where it came from, and it turned out it's this really special plant. Most of these garden cresses, the leaf is about the length of a finger, and this one is obviously longer than my hand. Um, really tasty as well, peppery flavor. These are some peppers from Aleppo, Syria. Uh, it's called Hascorea, another one that is in the USDA collection. Uh, but the seed bank where this, the seed market where, these, where they collected this in the 1980s was destroyed in the Syrian Civil War. Uh, this tomato's from Homs, Syria, which is another city that's just been devastated by the war. Uh, we actually got a number of those seeds to a group of, uh, of Syrian refugees in Lebanon. And this is some of those, some of those tomatoes growing, um, being grown by Syrian refugees there in, in Lebanon. And this is my friend Simon looking at uh, some very poorly grown sorghum from his village in South Sudan that I got those seeds from the USDA. They have thousands of different sorghums. And uh, he was laughing because I did a terrible job that year. We had an army worm infestation. But uh, usually we do much better. Uh, and this is my friend Vivian with the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library. And she's working to preserve, uh, preserve seeds from, um, from the, the occupied territories there. Uh, they, there are some giant watermelons in her hand and, and uh, all kinds of interesting things. This is a, this is a, um, a melon that's uh, treated like a cucumber as well called fakus. I'll talk a little bit more about sources for plant breeding uh, before I get into, into the uh, perennial discussion of perennials. Uh, and crop wild relatives is a really critical concept to understand. So, you know, we have all these crop plants. Almost none of them uh, appeared in nature in the form that they exist today as a, as a crop plant. Um, but a lot of, in a lot of cases, their wild relatives are still out there. Um, this is a wild relative of sunflower. You can see the, the differences between that and the modern domesticated sunflower, which is actually one of the few domesticated plants that is still grown from, from the eastern North America. Um, and then there are really interesting, uh, there's a bunch of really interesting relations between some wild plants that we have and, and their domesticated counterparts here. Um, the second one, you can see those are tiny, tiny wild beans. Uh, and that is a, the, the, those are directly related to the common domesticated bean uh, and those other grains there. You can see there's some, um, like that rootstock is a wild walnut plant, a uh, plant in California, but can be used as rootstock for, um, for domesticated walnuts. Uh, this map is really important. It shows where there are global hotspots where there are important crop wild relative species, but they are assessed as being in urgent need of further collecting to improve their representation in, green, in gene banks. Uh, in particular, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, uh, in Brazil, in Indonesia, in China, uh, South Africa, there are, and, and here in, in the eastern half of North America as well, there are relatives of really important wild plants that are just they're out there in the wild, uh, but they, are, they don't exist in gene banks. People, do, uh, people who are doing this work ha are going to have to go into the field to find this stuff. And with uh, population growth and habitat destruction and climate change, a lot of these natural wild populations are, are disappearing or diminishing. That's another Port Puerto Rican one. That is, that is indeed a wild uh, pineapple relative. So government gene banks are a critical critical source, a critical tool for plant breeders. Um, our government has uh, 19 of these uh, sites in the National Plant Germplasm System, uh, including Geneva, New York is the closest one to us here. They have a lot of apples, grapes, and cherries there. Um, 
Oh, out in Ames, Iowa, they have um, they have all sorts of grains. Um, Fort Collins, Colorado, has, has has a ton of those as well. Uh, down in Miami, they have coffee and chocolate. Puerto Rico has got a has got a site. Um, Pullman, Washington, up there has a lot of uh, beans, chickpeas, fava beans. Um, Corvallis, Oregon, has got the strawberry collection, the hops collection, chestnuts, um, raspberries, blueberries, all sorts of amazing things. So these are, this is the, this is like, you know, it, it's like Fort Knox. I mean, this is our, this is our country's most important resources are all locked up in these gene banks, but they are not, um, they are not impenetrable for people like us who want to work with this stuff. The National Plant Germplasm System, NPGS, has this site called GRIN. It's, uh, it's, the website is just uh, ars-grin.gov. Uh, that stands for Agricultural Research Service. So I typed in um, Massachusetts just out of curiosity to see how many things come up. There are 597 accessions that come up that have Massachusetts somewhere in their description. Uh, the first ones that come up here are, uh, there's a grape, potato, another grape, actually a bunch of grapes, another potato, uh, but there's all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different things. And um, anybody who has a legitimate research, breeding, or educational purpose is able to get seeds from the government. That is their job, to distribute it to us free of charge for those legitimate uses. Um, it's not something that should be abused, but because you know we don't want to risk losing this resource. Uh, but I've put in requests for hundreds of things at a time, and just explained in one paragraph what I plan to do with it all, and um, and they send it your way, um, free of charge. Often, you know, they're in little packets. You might get 50 seeds of something, so it takes a long time to uh, increase it and generate enough to to use it. Uh, but this is, an, this is another critical resource for, for plant breeders. If we have time at the end, maybe I'll go through and show you some details of how to, how to do it. So I mentioned, so I got involved uh, after Hurricane Sandy, and I started thinking I could probably spend the rest of my life bouncing from disaster to disaster doing this relief work, which was really, uh, it was really rewarding, and I, uh, I was really glad to be in a position to do it. Uh, but I started thinking, well, we have these deep problems that uh, it, it related to climate change, and I know that plants are uh, our potential solution. I've heard a lot through the years about uh, perennial wheat and the struggle to develop perennial wheat, perennial grains, perennial oil seeds. You know, we're uh, destroying the we're destroying the rainforest uh, all over the world to to produce palm oil, which uh, you know, which theoretically is could be a um, could be a useful tool for fighting climate change. It, it is a perennial plant, so it's sequestering carbon even as it's producing uh, a form of energy. Um, but the way you know destroying the rainforest to produce palm oil is 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 the absolute worst way to go. So we have all this land in this country. We're growing food for cows. We're growing. Um, we're growing gasoline in uh, in the form of genetically modified corn and soy that's, uh, that's being turned into ethanol. But uh, we're not growing food from enough perennials. So we started, we, we started thinking, my friend Dusty and I, if we could develop a, an open source system that anybody can use to create a project, recruit volunteers, and, um, and start working on some of these things and, and be able to be working in community with other people so that um, if, they, if, some, if the person who is the driving force behind a project um, gets hit by a bus or retires um, or just gets tired of it, there are other people to carry that work forward. The, the history of perennial wheat in this country and around the world, people have been thinking about perennial wheat, trying to grow perennial wheat for, for over a century now. And uh, we made great strides in the, about 100 years ago. But then um, World War I came, the funding ran out, people lost interest, and it slowed down. 
Uh, the same thing happened in the Soviet Union in the middle part of the 20th century. They were really interested in it and made great strides. And then again, uh, the war, war messed everything up. Uh, we were doing things again in the, um, in the 60s and 70s, especially in Davis, California. Uh, and then for whatever reason, again, institutional inertia, it kind of fizzled out. Uh, you know, the, the story is that they got, they got wheat, perennial wheat, to be about 75% of the yield of conventional wheat. And they just determined that that wasn't good enough. Um, but to me, 75% yield on a perennial system is, is fantastic. If we still had those seeds, um, you know, we would be growing that now. Because now, yeah, we, we, we understand the importance of perennial crops, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, this, is the, this is our farm in New Jersey. I was really happy when Google put the updated, uh, updated map after we'd done our work. So the, the owners of this land gave us a, a big strip. And uh, with our BCS, we created a bunch of beds. Uh, we tried to, there's a little rise into the, uh, and uh, it's, it's a pretty flat place, but we call it the hill, because at the top it's you know, 30, 40 feet higher than the other ends. And uh, so we tried to do some contours, catch the water. New Jersey's a great place to grow anything. We're zone seven. Um, and with a long field like this, we can isolate individual seed crops. And we made the decision with the nonprofit that we wanted to sell seeds to, um, to raise funds to become self-sufficient. We didn't really want to rely on uh, grants and donations for, for all of that. So yeah, we, we sell seeds. We give away a lot of seeds as well. So the key about perennial crops is that they are useful for carbon sequestration. Very basically, carbon dioxide is taken by the plants and converted into oxygen and water, and we are, uh, and the carbon gets locked up in the soil, locked up in the body of the plant, um, and, uh, this, and, and in the soil uh, micro, uh, microbiome as well, all the life in the soil. Some perennial crops that are common these days are asparagus. Uh, that's what seedling asparagus looks like. Rhubarb, uh, a lot of fruits like strawberries and apples, currants. Garlic is a perennial, though it's kind of grown in a, in a more biennial annual system. We, we're still ripping up the ground usually. Sorrel is a perennial herb. Uh, a lot of tropical perennials like dragon fruit, and you go to a market in California, you can get all sorts of perennial stuff. But here in a colder, uh, temperate place, it's harder to find you know, useful perennial food crops. Uh, this is one of my favorite, the uh, monkey puzzle tree. This is actually growing in North Jersey. That's a plant from, from Chile. It's, a, it's in the pine family. Those are the nuts. And um, yeah, the inside is, uh, looks like that. And they taste like a chestnut meets a, meets a cashew with maybe a faint pine nut kind of flavor. And this was a staple food for the Mapuche people in Chile for, for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and it's grown often as an ornamental, one tree at a time. And it won't produce for 30 or 40 years. But if you only have one tree and it's a male or a female, it's not going to make any nuts for you. You've got you to have a male and a female nearby each other. So you know, this is a plant that could feed people for 1,000 years once it's going. But people aren't thinking on that time scale. So we need people to be working with plants like these, putting them in the ground for the people who come after us. Uh, and these are what some seedlings look like. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little plant. Those, those, uh, they're, it's, it's incredibly sharp, though. These things are like little razors. Um, you, you, you can really hurt yourself on it. Um, so a plant like that is, is uh, really valuable in, a, in an agroecological system. Um, agroecology, uh, it's, a, it's a term that I generally prefer to permaculture, but uh, a lot of people can use, use them kind of interchangeably. But the basic principle is that agroecology amplifies the services provided by living organisms and takes optimal advantage of natural resources, including water, um, the sun, air, etc. Uh, but agroecology it's used around the world in a way that permaculture is not as a term. Um, and it, it, uh, it's, both, it's both a practice. Uh, you can farm agroecologically. 
it's a social movement as well, and it's an academic discipline. There are, there are schools that, that uh, there are people who have PhDs in agroecology and schools that teach it. Uh, but especially in, uh, in, in, uh, in other countries, ag agroecology is sort of the, the more common framing of, uh, of, a, of a whole system approach to agriculture. And uh, key to that is polyculture as opposed to monoculture. So there's a few, uh, the, the pictures on top are all monoculture, the pictures on the bottom are all examples of, of polyculture. Mostly in, the, in these pictures you're, you're just looking at two or three species, but um, you, know, you, can, you can fit a lot more species in a, in a functional system. Um, I'm really interested in our native perennial plants. That's a really, it's a good place to start. If, you wanna, if you're thinking in a general way about plants that need improvement for agriculture, uh, the native perennials have, uh, you know, the, the, the most important advantage is that they are from here. They are attuned to the, uh, to the climate here, to the weather patterns, to the soils, to the pests, um, everything about growing here, they, they've, uh, they evolved to grow here. Uh, but they might have agronomic qualities that make them uh, less than stellar as a crop plant, so they need some work. Um, these are maypot passion fruit, which I, I brought some. You can come taste it afterwards if you like. Uh, it's the a, it's a same genus as the tropical passion fruits, but it lives in the southeast as far north as Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Really delicious crop plant, uh, delicious wild plant. Not so, it's not really grown as a crop much because it has some drawbacks. Um, it doesn't produce till late in the season. It doesn't ripen all at once. Um, and uh, it's just something that people are unfamiliar with. So it needs, uh, it, it's, a lot of the fruit are small. And um, yeah, most people who grow it are growing it because it's pretty. Or they're growing it for the leaves, which are great for tea and a great uh, medicinal plant for a sleep aid, anti-anxiety, and anti-depression medicine. Um, but it has potential as a food plant. And, uh, and there's, some, there's been shown that there can be some improvements through breeding. You just need to do more work like that. Uh, this is a plant called a creeping cucumber. That's like a tiny little mouse melon, but this is a perennial uh, species native to the southeast. Also, with climate change, it's creeping its way north. This is a pop from a population uh, in Delaware, which is the first place I ever found it growing. The farthest north it's believed to grow. Um, yeah, they're like jelly bean sized watermelons, but they taste like little sour um, uh, cucumbers. Uh, ground cherries is another one. This, this is an annual ground, ground cherry, but there are perennial ground cherries as well. This is a, this is a perennial species. Wapato is a really interesting aquatic plant that uh, has an edible tuber. It was a, it was a common food for Native American people, but um, it's, it's not really consumed much anymore. Uh, but there's, you know, we have lots of freshwater habitat where this plant could be grown. And I don't know of anyone who's ever done any breeding work to improve it, increase the size of the tuber, work on the nutritional content or anything like that. Um, oh, it, grow, it grows in fresh water. The, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the tuber, came off of one of these plants. Yeah, you could find it near cattail. It'll, it'll grow in, it grows on the edge of uh, fresh water areas. This is a, uh, acid water wapato, which grows in more acidic water, like uh, the pine barrens. But uh, the, the, the common species is called, um, is called um, uh, Sagittaria latifolia, wide-leafed wapato, and that can be found growing uh, all over the country. This is a beech plum, which is a species native to the East Coast from about, uh, I think, southern Maine to um, Virginia or so, maybe North Carolina. And uh, it grows on sand dunes, so it sends out really long roots and uh, needs hardly any water. It has a lot going for it as a, as a plant because it's a native plum. Plums are really uh, susceptible to a lot of uh, pests and diseases in our area especially. So it's really hard to grow them organically, uh, though it is possible. But uh, these beech plums are attuned to, accustomed to all the native pests. So they just grow. You don't, we, don't, we have a bunch of these growing down in Jersey. We don't spray them with anything, we just let them go and we end up with lots of delicious, useful fruit. It can be used for making wine, making jam, making vinegar, 
just delicious. Uh, this is a common garden plant, the um, uh, Solomon seal, polygonatum. But most people don't realize that this is a great edible plant. The flowers are edible, the shoots are edible, like a little asparagus, and uh, that is what the rhizome looks like. And um, it's really starchy, really nutritious, uh, and really quite tasty. Uh, but I don't know anybody who's breeding this plant as a food crop. This is uh, a little Illinois bundle flower, which is a plant that people have been pretty excited about for a while. It's a native, native plant in the mimosa family, and it is, uh, uh, the, the seeds are high protein. There's been discussion about these as sort of a perennial replacement for soybeans, uh, if we can improve them through the years. It's going to take a lot of work with this plant. The seeds are pretty small. Uh, May apple is one of my favorite plants. It's, it's probably never going to be a major food crop, but it is a, it is a delicious f uh, fruit. It's also a medicinal plant. Uh, one of the first chemotherapy agents was synthesized from the root of this plant, uh, the toxin called potophyllin that's in, in the entire plant. But there are some out there that have really big fruit, uh, like this one. And, um, and it, you know, I eat these in the fall. Most people don't even know where to find them, and animals eat them. But there are, uh, there's the possibility of growing uh, and breeding even bigger ones. This is the biggest one probably that I ever found uh, from this past year. Really, the, only the flesh is uh, is non-toxic. The flesh of the ripe fruit it makes a fantastic jam. Almost tastes like pineapple, but it grows on the grows on the floor of our eastern woodlands. Uh, that's, what the, that's what the babies look like. Uh, if you grow it from seed, it takes 10 to 12 years for them to reach maturity, even though they only get about a foot high when they're, when they're fully mature. Uh, these are some chinkapin chestnuts. That's another native, uh, native plant that about 100 years ago, before the blight, people were really interested. There was a lot of discussion about breeding this plant, uh, but it is susceptible to the same blight that killed the American chestnut. It just... Um, chinkapins will grow back from the roots and they'll produce nuts for five or ten years before they, or even 15, before they die back uh, again. But it still has potential and through hybridization it could be a real, it could uh, one day become a useful native plant. Uh, these are, the one on the right is believed to be a naturally occurring hybrid from Georgia of a chinkapin and another chestnut species. I actually have a few of these in my pocket right now. Um, and that's from a farm down in Virginia. This, like, this patent lawyer who passed away in 2012 collected all of these chinkapins. He was obsessed with chinkapins. He patented a device to hull them that's about the size of a blender to remove that skin. And uh, he still has a few of these plants that, uh, that I've traced back to uh, this, these naturally occurring hybrids down in Georgia. And they're still growing down there in Virginia. Five, four or five plants where the graft survived. The uh, five-leafed plant you see creeping here on the vine, uh, that's Apios americana, the American ground nut. That's what the flowers look like. It's also called cinnamon vine because of the appearance of the flowers. It's a legume, and uh, the beans are edible. The seeds are edible like a, like a bean, uh, but it is most widely grown and consumed for the tubers. This was a staple crop for, for indigenous people in, on this continent. And uh, there are people actively breeding this now. It, it's, uh, again, it, it's happened in fits and starts. There was a guy named William Blackman uh, from, I think he was from Louisiana, who did a lot of work in Virginia on these for a few decades. I did, identified some really useful cultivars. And then he kind of, uh, he retired. Nobody picked up the work again until a guy named Steve Cannon, who works for uh, the USDA in Ames, Iowa, picked up the mantle and now has Blackman's collection and is working on uh, breeding more. There's a, a friend of mine in Pennsylvania doing the same. This is a really, really potentially very useful crop. And it's actually, it actually is cultivated as a food crop in East Asia, in Korea and Japan. People, um, it was brought over there maybe 120 years ago and uh, people developed a real taste for it, in particular in one, one location. But you know, there are some work to be done to make a, to figure out systems for growing this in, in an ecologically sound way. And, um, and there's more work to be done breeding to, to make uh, 
better. Uh, the, the roots end up like a daisy chain, they say, with a, a tubers strung along them. And often they are far apart. So breeders are looking to, for ones where the tubers are close together, where they're big, where they store well, uh, where they taste good. Um, so that's, that's the kind of work that, that I'm talking about when, we, when we're talking about breeding native perennial plants. There, there's a lot of potential, not a lot of people doing the, doing the work. A plant like that, you could dig up the whole plant and then replant the tuber in the spring. Uh, or you could dig up half of it, leave half of it, and it'll grow back um, right there. Something like this, it's often difficult to get all the tubers unless you're digging up the entire field, you know, using a potato digger or something. So you're going to end up probably leaving some in the ground. But these are all things that, you know, we need to figure out the best ways to, to grow these things. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to take, take some time and, and a lot of work, but uh, people are doing it, and they, they can all, always use help. But part of the, the, the key take, one of the key takeaways that I want to leave you with from this talk is that this is, not, this is not complicated work. Yeah, it's time consuming, but the work of plant breeding has been done by people for 10,000 years, since the, since the beginning of agriculture. Every farmer was a plant breeder because they were saving their best seeds for the next year, and that simple act is plant breeding. Uh, so if you're saving seeds, you might not think about it that way, but you're a plant breeder. If, you, if you're taking any kind of a selective eye to what you're, uh, to what you're growing. Um, and uh, you know, it can be done on a backyard scale. It, you, don't need a huge, you don't need a huge farm to do this. Uh, there's, there's, there's a great deal that can be done on a small scale. These are some uh, seedlings of a perennial kale project that, uh, that uh, a friend of mine is doing through our website. And uh, he's been working on this for years. Uh, there are these perennial kales that have kale or collard-like leaves that were mainly um, from, uh, from Europe grown as animal feed. A lot of them were not bred for, for human consumption, so they, don't, they didn't always necessarily taste so great. Um, but then a bunch of them have, were, have been crossed together by various people, and uh, the result is this incredibly diverse population uh, of, uh, of perennial kales. There's, uh, on our website, there's a picture uh, that shows some, some of them full grown, and they're, they really all look quite different. Uh, but some of these can live for a long, long time. And uh, peren so perennial greens, as, uh, there's huge potential there. This is a perennial leek. Uh, most leeks, by their nature, want to be perennial. Uh, but this one makes a lot of little offsets. Elephant garlic, you might see at the supermarket, is actually a leek. Those big cloves, leeks will do that. If you leave a leek in the ground, you'll see these little cloves appearing. And they want to survive the winter. But there are ones that have been bred for it that are much more strongly perennial. And that's a great potential, uh, potential crop. And this is a perennial beet relative uh, that would, could be used, again, as a perennial green. Uh, sea kale is another, is another great green. It's a, it's a brassica related to cabbage. Uh, but it's native to the uh, northern Europe, to the seacoast. This is one growing in its natural habitat. The uh, orange spikes are, are some kind of dock growing up through it. It's just those leaves. Uh, and this is one growing on the coast of Oregon, where it was, uh, it was put in a kitchen garden at a lighthouse at uh, Yakina Head. And um, the, light, the garden has probably been gone for 100 years. Uh, but the sea kale went wild, and it now grows on the cliffs beneath the uh, beneath the place. Uh, and there's some, you know, that that's that's some resilient plant right there. Um, some people are interested in in breeding this sea kale for the seed pods, which when you harvest them when they're green, they can be like a little cabbage flavored pea. Really interesting potential food product. In Europe, traditionally, they are grown for their blanched shoots in the spring. They would take these terracotta pots, put them over the plants where they grow wild on the beach, and then, uh, and then harvest the blanched stems. And uh, they really considered a real delicacy. Uh, I put some sea kale leaves on a pizza, and it was really delicious. Uh, some folks are interested in breeding the, uh, for bigger flower heads, because as you can see, um, it could make a really interesting perennial broccoli, essentially. 
Um, this, is a, this is a wild relative called um, Abyssinic, uh, Cranby Abyssinica, and that's, that's an oilseed Cranby, an oilseed relative of sea kale. The oil is not edible. It has um, erucic acid in it that makes it poisonous, but it's a useful industrial oil. And um, so there's the potential through hybridization to potentially create a perennial uh, oilseed plant like that that could be used for, for all sorts of applications. Uh, another cousin in this family is the tartar bread plant. This is a, this is a tiny seedling in the spring, um, and then I think the spring after its first year, and then this is that same plant in the fall. It produces a massive root, which was traditionally ground up uh, and added to flour 50-50 to make bread. Um, so that's another, another really interesting crop, and, and like horseradish, you can harvest most of the root and then leave a chunk of it and, uh, and get more. That is not a plant. Uh, that's a sperm whale, which used to, be, uh, used to be a major commodity, international commodity, sperm whale head oil, uh, sperm, spermacidae they called it, was used to make candles, was used for all sorts of pharmaceuticals. But it can be replaced, uh, by, and it was largely replaced in the, in the 1970s when, when uh, sperm whale uh, whaling was banned by jojoba seed. Uh, most people now only ever hear of jojoba as something in a shampoo or you know, other, kinds of, uh, other kinds of cosmetics. Um, but if you look at the USDA's entry about this species, uh, which is native to the desert southwest uh, of this country and northern Mexico, um, where it says economic uses, it says potential replacement for petroleum. Um, and there was some buzz about this in the, uh, in the 70s when, you know, when we had, um, when we had the uh, gas crisis. Uh, but with the, with the increase in production and the, and the uh, lowering of the, the cost of, uh, of oil, petroleum, jojoba, interest in jojoba as a, as a major crop got lost. But it has a lot going for it. I mean, it's a desert plant, so it needs hardly any water. It actually thrives in drought years. It has some level of uh, frost susceptibility. Uh, frost, um, it, it can survive some, some frost, moderate frost. Um, but it, uh, it grows in places where we're not growing a lot of crops uh, and where you know, there's, we've, we've converted a lot of that land to range land. So we've already messed with the natural ecosystem there in, in, in extensive ways. We could be growing a crop like this um, to produce the, uh, it, it roots very easily in vermiculite. Um, those are what the berries look like, and they're loaded with, loaded with a, a liquid ester, liquid wax, essentially, uh, that, can be, that can be used to, yeah, replace petroleum. And uh, so not only save the whales, but, uh, you know, we could, we, could, uh, we could be using plants in a sustainable way to, uh, to replace all of this uh, extractive industries. Um, I think ultimately we're going to need to, you know, get off of the technology that runs on fossil fuels and, and, uh, and you know, potentially biofuels as well, but we're a long way from doing that. So perennial grains is sort of the holy grail of perennial staple crop development. This picture's from the Land Institute. That's on top is an annual wheat plant on its side. You can see the roots go maybe a foot down. And then this is perennial wheat grass, which is a relative of wheat. And those roots can be 25 feet long. So the, the, you know, the stabilization that that provides for, uh, for soil to prevent erosion is, is immense. Um, it, it uh, you know, by in preserving that soil, it's also trapping so much carbon down there. And uh, so the Land Institute's been working on uh, something they call Kernza. They've trademarked that name. And it's a perennial wheatgrass that's been bred, that's been selectively um, bred to have larger seeds. And my understanding is they've got the seeds to about one-fifth the size of, a, of an average wheat seed. And um, the yield is not really not very high at this point, but this is the first thing that the Land Institute has released in, in 35 or 40 years of work, and uh, it, it has some promise. Um, and and it's people are getting excited about it because uh, we just don't have any perennial grains on the market, basically. But it still has a long way to go. 
uh, perennial wheat created by hybrids between perennial species and annual wheats also have some potential. Uh, this is what one particular one looks like that we've, we've gotten seeds from and experimented with. We had one plant that survived four winters and continued to produce for us before it finally did uh, crap out. And that's the seeds coming, the, the plant coming up in the spring. This is Job's Tears, the kernel of Job's Tears, which you might find in an Asian market being sold as pearled barley, but it's actually not barley at all. Um, and uh, Job's Tears is more closely related to corn and sorghum. This is what the plant looks like, the, the flower spike. Kind of see, it's got these little hairs coming off of it that look like corn silks. And it is, it, it, it's definitely reminiscent of corn in some ways, but uh, that's a perennial plant in the tropics already. And now most Job's Tears, uh, you might have seen them, Chris had some at the seed swap. They have really hard shells and they're used for jewelry. Um, but there are some varieties that are thin hulls that are used as a grain, like this was hulled by a machine. And uh, they're called the Mahuan Job's Tears, and they're grown in, in uh, Japan and China primarily, India as well. Uh, these are different accessions. I tried all of these last year. You can see uh, the kernel on the inside of this one, which is a Japanese variety, and then this is a a strange, a mysterious tropical variety that I got from a friend. Uh, I only got a handful of seeds. I had five plants this year, and uh, it had too long of a season for New Jersey. It didn't produce any seeds for me, but I dug up the plants. I can keep them alive through the winter because it is a perennial, and then find a place further south where, where they can be grown to, to get more seeds. But this really big kernel, you can see how big it is compared to the commercial varieties, You know, I think has some huge potential at least for, for tropical areas as a, as a perennial grain. This is an incredibly nutritious grain in addition to being quite delicious. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, sorghum, which is one of my favorite crops and uh, has also some, some real potential as a perennial crop. It's another one the Land Institute has been working on, uh, but we're, we're playing around with, with our own uh, seeds that we got from different sources. So this is an annual one from, from Kenya uh, called White Liboywa. And uh, um, this, is, uh, this is popped sorghum. It'll pop just like popcorn. Really tasty. You can, you can make flour with it and make bread. The stalk of the sorghum can be pressed through an old sorghum mill like this and juice squeezed out of it. Um, and it produces, uh, produces a really sweet juice that can be boiled down into molasses. Uh, and it's really delicious. It's more nutritious than, than typical molasses. And uh, this is still a pretty common crop regionally in the southeast. Um, but I know people, I know a farmer who grows it in Vermont. There's no reason why it can't be grown in New England as well. And, um, you know, it, has the potential to help reduce our reliance on, on tropical sources for sweeteners. This is sorghum. And, and again, it's a, it's a grain crop and a cane crop. So you can be getting two crops from the same plant. You can be getting sweet stalk and an edible grain. And that grain is actually also edible when it's still green. Um, you can harvest it when they're still green and put put a couple sticks in a, in a couple of seed heads in a, uh, in a pillowcase, beat them with a broom handle, the seeds all come out, and then those green seeds are like chewy and sweet and delicious. It's, it's kind of like the sorghum equivalent of sweet corn. It's a, it's a seasonal delicacy in parts of India, Sudan, places where sorghum is the staple crop. And there are, there are millions, maybe a billion people around the world who rely on sorghum as their as their staple, staple food crop. Uh, it's also the most widely consumed alcoholic drink in the world, uh, is a, is a, is a uh, spirit distilled from sorghum grain called baiju in China. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like vodka in, in East Asia. Yeah, so sorghum is, uh, so this is some sorghum that we grew a few years ago. Most of these are annuals, although in some tropical areas they will, they will grow as a perennial. And then the one in the middle 
which has, uh, you can see the grain kind of peeking in, peeking out here like that little red bit. This is a perennial sorghum that has a, the, the structure that uh, encloses the seed on sorghum is called the gloom, and it has a high gloom. A lot of the ones that are useful for grain have very little gloom covering the seed, so they're very easy to thresh by hand or just by beating them on the ground, beating them on a carpet or something. Uh, but then there are ones that, are, that were bred more for animal feed, for forage, um, or they are grown for, um, or they are uh, grown for brooms. Sorghum, uh, sorghum is called broom corn, certain varieties that have not a ton of seeds, but a lot of little stems. And once you strip the seeds off and bundle a few of them together, uh, they, made, they made great brooms. And people, there are people who still make brooms out of sorghum. But this one was probably the result of a cross between sorghum and its wild, a wild weedy relative called Johnson grass, which is a common pest in many parts of this country, uh, an agricultural pest nuisance. Johnson grass has tiny, tiny little seeds that have no use economically as, as a grain. But it's believed that somebody a long time ago crossed some Johnson grass with some sorghum, probably did some back crosses with sorghum to create um, something that is this, uh, that looks like this. Um, this is an, actually an African perennial sorghum that is a straight up grain crop. But, so this is the one that we were, we were given to work with. Someone gave me two heads of this perennial sorghum that they had growing at, uh, in Oregon uh, that had been given to them by a guy who was working with it for many years. And uh, their patch actually died out, they think from some kind of pest in Oregon but they had two seed heads to give me, and we planted a bunch of it in New Jersey a few years ago, and we had one plant survive one winter <laughs> in New Jersey. Um, it's more perennial in a, in a more mild climate like Oregon, clearly. But that one plant gave us something to work with. And because there's already a lot of diversity in this population, every, pl every seedling looked different from the next. Uh, and the seed heads look different, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. This one that survived the winter that produced rhizomes uh, to, to spread a little bit, the second year it produced 36 seed heads from the same root base. This is what it looked like a few weeks uh, into the season. It started, started flowering pretty low to the ground and, um, and it made a whole bunch of these seed heads. So, Suddenly we had, something, we had something with some potential there. So we took all those seeds and um, from, all, from that one plant, we call, the, the original population came to us called M61. I'm not sure where the name came from. So we call this one M61 Survivor and we sent the seeds out to as many volunteers around the country as were interested in growing it. And now they're growing it and we're gonna see where it will, where the descendants of this plant can survive the winter, and uh, and we want ones that are going to that produce a, a nice amount of grain. That the grain is is threshable, that it's possible to remove it from the gloom with relative ease, and um, so this could potentially be a temperate perennial grain. And it might you know we might be you know a decade or two away from having this be a viable crop, or maybe even quicker. Uh, but it, the more people we have working on it, plant breeding is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And so the more people you have looking for that needle, the more likelihood you are to find it. You're looking for that perfect combination of traits uh, that's, that's everything you want. And that's what plant breeders have been doing for, for thousands of years and what plant breeders are still doing today. We have no need to be using um, genetic engineering. This can all be done on, at home scale, farm scale, uh, the way we've been doing it for, for tens of thousands of years with uh, you know, very little risk of creating some kind of, some kind of novel protein that's a new toxin that's going to you know, cause allergies for people or you know, carcinogen or something um, or have untold effects on wildlife and on the microbiome. You know, we, genetic engineering is a, is a gamble, genetic roulette. Um, 
plant breeding, traditional plant breeding is what we've been doing for, for 10,000 years. And it, it can keep working for us. We just need more people to be doing it. Um, I can I could spout off on genetic engineering uh, plenty and happy to talk more about that uh, in the Q&A, which I want to leave plenty of time for. Uh, but that is, um, that is the talk. That's my contact info. Please write it down if you, uh, if you want to get in touch. The website at the bottom, um, anybody can create a profile. You can volunteer for, uh, for projects that are up there on the website. Um, or you can create your own project and recruit volunteers for it. So I'm going to turn the lights back on and um, happy to answer some questions if folks have them. I will show you, uh, I'll show you the, our seed store website. If you go to efnseeds.com, you, uh, you can see what our seed store looks like. We had about 125 different varieties on there. A lot of them are things you can't get anyplace else. Uh, we, have, we had about 25 in the perennial edibles section, including some crops that are just, they're just not things that, that are available. They tend to sell out quickly. We'll, we're going to be putting up our new stock for next year in probably about January. That's what, usually when we get everything up. This is going to be our third year with the website. Um, so yeah, we have these, like, this, is, this is that perennial kale, um, some full grown, pictures of the full grown ones. And uh, we've got this multiplier onion mix, which is really exciting. Multiplier onions are like shallots or potato onions. You stick one bulb in the ground in the fall, and it's going to turn into a nest like garlic, and you'll have a bunch more in the spring. That's how people used to grow onions. Um, you know, before there was a big commercial onion set uh, industry. Uh, the maypop passion fruit. This Caucasian mountain spinach is a really cool crop. That's a really, really cold, hardy, uh, perennial, vining, leafy green that can be treated like spinach. Is that the same as Malabar? No. Malabar is a tropical, tropical thing. Um, Hablitzia is from the Caucasus. Hablitzia tamnoides is the name. Our friend grows this in Colorado. Uh, and uh, Malabar spinach is not a perennial, at least not, not in the north. It won't survive our winter. This survives every winter. Got this prickly pear that we found growing in a front yard in New Jersey that's, that's really big. Good King Henry is a, is a lamb's quarter relative that's also edible as a leafy green. This perennial celery is a Korean, Korean crop, uh, also called pig celery from this island off the coast of Korea. Ramps are obviously something people are uh, primarily foraging for. It takes a long time to develop, to, to grow a patch of ramps. That's that creeping cucumber. Yeah, so we, we've got quite a, few, quite a few interesting things on here uh, that, that you're not going to find uh, from other folks. But then we do have, you know, tomatoes and um, cucumbers and squash and everything. Uh, yeah, we have a lot, we have a whole, commu a whole section here on threatened communities where we have stuff from Afghanistan and Syria and uh, some places like Moldova and Minsk, uh, uh, Belarus that are threatened by uh, terrible politics and also poverty. People are just fleeing these rural communities and, and going to bigger cities. So the places where a lot of this genetic uh, diversity lives uh, are because of where people are moving themselves are just, it's just disappearing. Uh, so we've got we've to salvage all of this stuff. Uh, Puerto Cortez is in Honduras. Sure, so Sudan, Sudan grass is a wild relative from Africa. So sorghum Sudan is a, is a hybrid between the two. And um, it, uh, I think that in tropical places, it also would, uh, could become a perennial. But uh, sorghum Sudan is grown as a cover crop. It, uh, because it's tropical, it'll winter kill. It creates a ton of biomass. So that makes it, that makes it really valuable as a cover crop. And sorghum, uh, the same, you know, the sugars inside the stalk of the sorghum that make it possible to make molasses from it uh, also makes it great food for microbes in the soil. So people will chop up, chop up the um, stalks and, and put them back in the ground or just let them rot in place there. Uh, often people will grow sorghum Sudan or, or, or even just sorghum as a cover crop with cowpeas, uh, which is also tropical. And cowpeas are you know, a great nitrogen fixer. Um, cowpeas are also great 
a great all-around crop. The leaves are edible, the pods are edible, the beans are edible. Uh, the, the leaves of cowpea is one of the most high protein green foods. It's just really fantastic. I definitely recommend, oh, there's a, I recommend some cowpeas. This is one that we, one that we sell. This one's from the desert. So again, we grow, even though we're in New Jersey, we, we tend to grow a lot of stuff from desert areas because we like to dry farm. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot easier and, and uh, you know, to not have to worry about irrigation. If we have a plant that's gonna just grow, we wanna grow that one. Yeah, we've been involved with some, with some of that. Um, my colleague Dusty, who started this nonprofit with me, is now out in Minnesota. He has a, um, there are some people, it seems like a small percentage of people, but some people get a violent reaction to eating cooked pawpaw or dried pawpaw. It's, it's, uh, it's a strange thing, it doesn't seem to be an allergy. It is, um, but yeah, Dusty had a negative, negative uh, experience with it, so he stopped. He lost his taste for them, even even raw, um, after getting sick from eating them um, cooked. But I, before I knew that, I was cooking with them all the time. I made like a, I made a pawpaw pumpkin pie once that was out of this world, and um, there's a lot you can do with it. But pawpaw, yeah, pawpaws are another great native crop, and people are. People are doing a lot of breeding work with pawpaws. There's a guy named uh, Neil Peterson down in, I think, in Kentucky, who works for the university there, and he's he's been working with pawpaws, breeding them for a long time. So there are some that make some really big fruit at this point, like a lot of diversity to flavors as well. Uh, I tend to like the wild ones um, just fine, but uh, yeah, for for yeah. Yeah, they do. They will survive. I've heard of people growing them pretty far north. I know in the wild they they even grow in Ontario, like southern Ontario. So I, I think you could grow pawpaws here with with no problem, especially as the way the climate's changing. Although you know, you never know. What we uh, even as the summers are getting warmer, we we still get these we're getting these polar vortex winters that that get really really cold. So it may be. Uh, all of those right wingers who say, "Oh, we're going to be expanding growing growing regions," the sugar, yeah, the the juice from the stalk, boil that down, and uh, you you know you could use the same kind of evaporator pan you would for maple syrup, and uh, and just evaporate it out and end up with that molasses. Okay. I think the juice is a great product. If somebody would pasteurize that and put it in a bottle, I would buy that at the store and just mm -hmm. drink it. It's like. It's like a green, sweet juice. You squeeze a lemon in and you got lemonade. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, we are actually. Um, so the Open Source Seed Initiative, OSSI, is, um, was started by a bunch of folks at the University of Wisconsin, I believe, and, uh, and some other university folks. It's an, effort to, um, it's an effort to get seeds out on the market that are never patentable. The, the idea originally was to create a special license for these seeds um, that that says that uh, you know that they can't ever be patented. Ultimately, they they settled on what they call the open source pledge, uh, the Aussie pledge. I think we have one variety that we've pledged to it so far. We call it Dietrich's Wild Broccoli Rob, and we introduced it. It's it's essentially a, a lightly selected version of a wild uh, of a feral turnip that grows in South Jersey, probably introduced by. Uh, Italian American farmers a century ago, um, who were growing it as a leafy green, uh, like seven top turnip, uh, is a is a leafy green, uh, but it went wild. It survives the winters in New Jersey, and no matter what winter throws at it, they they survive. Um, you know, we this is like the plants in the spring when everything else is dead, and they're 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 growing already. We'll start getting flower spikes on these sometimes as early as mid March. We've had them coming out of the snow. Um, and uh, it, the taste is just like broccoli, Rob. The, the owners of the land, when we went down there, called it wild broccoli, Rob. They said, oh, you should be eating the wild broccoli, Rob. And um, so we started doing that. But yeah, I, I clicked on this because this is part of the open source seed initiative. So we pledged it that um, the pledge says that anybody who grows this and anybody you pass the seeds on to is going to grow, is going to keep it free. I want to see if I can read the, the whole pledge to you. There it is. So you have the freedom to use these Aussie pledge seeds in any way you choose. In return, you pledge not to restrict others' use of these seeds 
or their derivatives by patents or other means, and to include this pledge with any transfer of these seeds or derivatives. So they're very, they're very specific that Aussie is for plants that somebody bred. So if you put work into breeding it, you can slap the pledge onto it. They don't want you to put it on something that you had nothing to do with creating. But there's been some discussion about putting it on populations and sort of these synthetic land races that people are working on. Uh, and some people are, some people, because this is the open source movement, some people are slapping the Aussie pledge on even without telling Aussie that they're doing it. Uh, but they like to, uh, they like to know, the organization likes to know, you know, who's doing what with their things. Right now there are 480 different crops that are, that are pledged through Aussie. You can see, you know, Frank's uh, amaranth here, four stars, explorers mix. Oregon Plenty Asparagus over here from Chuck Burr at Restoration Seeds. There's a basil over here, bush dry beans. Um, so this is, it's a really, really great project because, you know, patents, uh, I'm, I'm of the mind that we never should have allowed patents on forms of life. It seems wrong. But uh, this, is an, this is pushing back against that. And uh, if, you, if you do any breeding, I highly recommend that you um, you know, if you have something that's a finished product that you're putting out in the world, contact Aussie, get them to put it on their website, put the pledge on every packet when you, when you distribute the seeds, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really important movement. I appreciate your asking that question. Yes. I mean, wild, wild plants are, they're just all, they're, they're way less fussy than domesticated plants. I mean, they're, they're doing their job. They don't need any intervention. Most of these domesticated plants require some kind of human intervention. They, you know, if we had, if humans disappeared, corn would be extinct within three years. You know, you see a field that had corn on it, maybe there's a few plants coming up, but corn needs to be grown all together because it's not gonna pollinate itself. The seeds do not survive well out in nature. They, need, they wanna be dried and brought indoors and protected from rodents. So, it, you know, that's a completely human created plant and it just it would just die out. Uh, but uh, Teosinte, the the wild relative down in Mexico, you know that that will survive for uh, for a long, long time uh, on its own, as it has for thousands, millions of years. All right. Any uh, any last questions? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, rhubarb is a really is a really fun crop. It's a great perennial crop, and um, you know people can use it for for all sorts of uh, things beyond a rhubarb pie. It makes great, uh, makes great jam or jelly. Um, rhubarb wine used to be quite a popular thing. There's actually a variety called German wine rhubarb or something. Champagne rhubarb was used for making a, like a champagne. But rhubarb does not, will not grow true to, uh, to type. Um, if you plant the seeds from a really great rhubarb plant, you plant 100 seeds, you're gonna get 100 different seedlings. And some of them are gonna be really weak little plants, and then some of them are gonna be, um, some of them are gonna be much more, uh, much more successful. So the key with growing rhubarb from seed is just to, um, to grow a lot and let them go for, for about three years, because you're not gonna know which ones are good until three years in when they reach maturity. Um, but the first couple of years, you'll you'll find them um, just, yeah, not doing not doing so well. This is uh, the ones that we sell seeds for is called we call it Tracy rhubarb. Uh, we we rescued it from uh, from uh, the backyard of some friends of mine who were an elderly couple years after they passed away. Their kids were having somebody mow the lawn every couple of weeks, and the garden was completely gone. And the uh, daughter-in-law brought me to back to the property, and she was pacing around the yard saying, I know there's some rhubarb back here. And she found this like pencil-thin stem with like a quarter-sized leaf on the end. And was like, that's it. That's the rhubarb. And we'd stuck the shovel in, and there was a huge root ball under there. It was probably 50 years old. And uh, I was able to separate it into three or four chunks, grew them back at, my friend, at a friend's in Pennsylvania. And within a year, we had this beautiful rhubarb plant with these really thick stalks and these absolutely enormous leaves. You can see on the left is the Tracy rhubarb, on the right is a, is a more typical one. So the stalks are not as long, but they're thick. And so it's actually easier to work with in the kitchen. 
um, and they have this huge leaf, so they, they shade out all kinds of weeds that were growing near it. Uh, it's just a, it's a great plant. This is my niece with, uh, with, one, of the, <laughs> with one of the leaves. She, she really enjoyed that. And um, I grew it for three years and never had it flower. But I was distributing it around, and I sent some to my sister in Ann Arbor, and um, they got it to flower. It, you know, it liked it. it. It wanted to flower in Ann Arbor. Had no interest in flowering in New Jersey. Uh, and then, so we got a ton of seeds from her and, and decided to start selling them. And then the next year, she didn't, hers didn't flower at all, but my like five plants in New Jersey did flower. So we have a good supply of this seed now, and uh, you know we're sure that there's some interesting genetics in there. It's a it's an old variety. We've lost track of what it ever you know what it originally was, but the you know we we gave it the name Tracy after the family who uh, whose place it was at, and. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's really lovely. A lot of people only want rhubarb that's got a really red stalk for the color. To me, this, is, well, this one qualifies as red enough. Um, it's, got, it's got some red coloring, but it's all about the flavor. And I don't care if the rhubarb, you know, if it's green, uh, if, if, as long as it tastes great and it's easy to grow. And the best thing about this from the farmer's perspective is not just that it suppresses weeds, that it's good in the kitchen, that it's perennial, um, it seems to be that Japanese beetles have no interest in this rhubarb. They'll go after all the other rhubarbs we grow, but they have no interest in this one. So um, that's, that's one of the worst pests of Japanese beetles. Rhubarb will often go pretty dormant in a hot summer. It'll stop producing, it, not dormant, but it'll just stop producing, uh, producing new leaves. And when there's real pressure from Japanese beetles, it can really weaken the plant. So. Um, yeah, this is this is a this is a cool one that we're 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 pretty excited about, and obviously, you know, we're the only ones who have these plants, so nobody else is selling those seeds. And I'm sure that there's there's so many other interesting plants like this sitting in somebody's backyard, and and nobody's just looking for it. So if you start if you start looking with a plant breeder's eye, you're going to find interesting things everywhere you look, especially if you're looking at the wild plants. Um, it, that, that are native to this area. But you know, I urge you to sign up on our website, but just start thinking about how you can improve the plants in your life. Uh, you, you, you don't have to rely on seed companies. If, the, if you're not getting good carrot seed, you can never find good carrots, you're not able to go, grow good carrots, it's the seed's fault, it's not your fault. And you can, you know, three seasons, you can significantly improve that. Um, carrots are, I always talk about carrots as a and as an example, because carrots carrots need attention. If you're growing carrots for seed, you have to dig up every carrot, and you want to rip off the bottom, and you want to taste it. Because if that carrot has that soapy flavor that you all know from supermarket carrots, or has a bitter flavor, that's going to be passed on to the progeny. But if you taste all of them, and then stick them back in the ground, put, put them in a root cellar, put them in some moist sand in a you know, 50 degree place all winter, and then stick them back in the ground, even if you've removed the bottom half of the carrot, it's still gonna produce seeds for you. And, uh, and that's, how, that's the kind of work that it takes just to maintain uh, a good carrot. You know, carrots are pretty close to their wild uh, wild relative, which is Queen Anne's lace. But we, we've got to do that with all these crops. It, it takes work. So big companies that are just growing out a huge field of carrots and taking all the seed and packeting them in 99 cent packets that you can buy at the supermarket, they're going to produce shitty carrots. And it's not your fault. It's not your soil's fault. It's the seed. Um, but you can, uh, you know, if you go to small scale seed companies like Wild Garden Seed in Oregon or Adaptive Seeds, or uh, Hudson Valley Seeds, um, Fedco, places where people are working with small-scale growers who know how to grow seeds, who care about seeds, uh, who care about, uh, about taste and quality and nutrition, that's where you, you want to get your seeds from. Well, I think we are at time. I'm happy to stick around if anyone has any more questions. And thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it. Oh yeah, and I do have some of this Maypop passion fruit. If you've never tasted it, you can come up here and try some.